Um, I'm going to hand over to Kevin Fong now. And Kevin is Kevin is a doctor. Kevin is a doctor, but he's also a qualified astrophysicist, and he spent a long time um, studying space medicine. Um, I believe has a, has or had ambitions to be an astronaut. So he knows a lot about space. So I'm going to hand over to Kevin. Kevin came on one of our flights with us, and uh, he's going to talk uh, from a personal perspective. Um, about space and uh, about zero gravity flight. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Nicola. And, and uh, after what is it, 11 years now, uh, I should say again, thank you very much for letting me come on this flight. I was on this flight with Morag and uh, the guys in 2001, and I'm in the background there puking up somewhere. Uh, they, are, they are quite violent. I've now flown. So, I, so I. I'm a consultant in Easters now. I work for the Wellcome Trust. I'm a public engagement fellow for them. Uh, I was an astrophysicist before I went to medical school, uh, uh, and and I worked for NASA for a while on medical with the American Medical Operations Group. Um, uh, and I probably still do want to be an astronaut. So I'm not entirely sure I'm going to get a chance to now. But um, uh, I, I want. There's a whole lecture about the effects of. Um, weightlessness on the human body that I can give and takes about an hour, but that's not really the point of, of this talk. The point of this talk is really about the experience that I had out in Russia, which was amazing. And I've flown now in the United States with NASA uh, on a very uh, tight campaign. I flew in Russia in 2001, and I, I flew very recently uh, in Europe. They're very different experiences, and I am very pleased to have flown with Arts Catalyst in Russia because I, that was the richest of the three experiences uh, by a long, long way. Um, and entirely because of the art science element of that for me. I mean, I, the, the, the American experience was, was super, but, but quite sterile in comparison to that, that statement that whoever it was made about if you'd been to Swindon, it would have been the same. I don't think anything in Swindon is quite the same, to be honest with you. But, uh, um, but it was great, and I, I remember it really well. It was a weird time. It was 2001, and it was something like October or November, so it was within weeks of 9-11. So the general, we weren't even sure if we were going to fly right for the last moment. And we rocked up to Moscow. Oh, I, I remember at the airport, very clearly meeting Jem and Anderson, and they rock up. And I've never been on an art science thing before. Uh, and I sort of considered myself a bit of a scientist at the time. And these guys have got a carpet under their arms. <laughs> I'm like, what have I got into you here? I'm like, what are you going to do with that? And they just gestured at the carpet and shrugged. And I was like, right, great. Uh, I'm not totally sure what I'm getting onto here. And, 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 uh, and everyone I met sort of had this very different take on the whole thing uh, and the whole experience which was nothing but enriching all the way through. And when I was in America, it was all very paramilitary, and, and, and you went in and you did your job, and you floated, and you executed your tasks, and you got out of there. Whereas going out with Arts Catalyst, it was, it was much more engaging. I, and, I, and I remember being on the bus on the way from the airport uh, to the hotel, and people going through the phrase book, and uh, being amused to find the bit that says problems. <laughs> problems with law enforcement, and there is actually a phrase in that book that says uh, uh, what to do when you <laughs> have trouble with the police, and it says uh, uh, what seems to be the problem officer, with the Russian translation, <laughs> is there anything I can do <coughs> right now to help officer? <laughs> and then the third phrase is, is there a fine I can pay in cash <laughs> that will help That's officer? And this is straight face it. Go to the British Council. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was kind of the tone of the whole thing, and then, and then for me, the the whole it was a really interesting cultural difference because all of my training had been with NASA or with American operations, which are very tight and very. When, when I flew Parabolics in America, um, I uh, we went on a Monday and I ran on a treadmill, uh, and they you know took some blood from me and I gave me a urine sample. And on Tuesday. We went through decompression chain. They put us in pressure chambers. We did explosive decompression. We did slow decompression. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, they put us on treadmills and did spirometry and optometry and audiometry. Uh, on Thursday, we went in and they put you on a chair and they spun you around. So that's what it's like to feel sick. Great, thanks very much. Uh, and, then, and then they gave you a lecture on Thursday night. 
about what you should and shouldn't eat. So, uh, so, so milk and sausages and stuff are considered antisocial the morning before a parabolic flight. Uh, <laughs> or, or, oranges are fine uh, because they taste about the same on the way up as they do on the way down. Uh, and, uh, and it's true, it's true. And, and, uh, and then off we flew for our 45 parabola campaign. Uh, and in Russia it was much more relaxed than that. We turned up to the hotel, we turned up to the airstrip the next day. Uh, some bloke put his head in the door who appeared to be the flight surgeon said, does anyone have cardiac problem? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, and half the people didn't hear him. Oh, the other half didn't really understand what he just said, and so everyone sort of shrugged at him, and they went, okay, everyone, get on the aircraft. <laughs> and so, so it was very different, and I, I was slightly nervous about, about all of that. Um, uh, but, but, and I, and I also remember sitting on the tarmac, uh, thinking, and it's a big aircraft. I mean, there are the three hour plane on it's the biggest by a long, long way. And, and, and you know, it takes quite a lot to get. It's, there's a lot of skill in piloting these things. In, in the European version, they have three people up front. One does the throttle, one does the pitch, and one does the yaw. So that the whole thing is just flown by three people through the whole parabola, so it's smooth all the way through. Uh, and, and, and this thing is much bigger and, and uh, you've got much more space to fly around in, but, but it's, it's actually, I think, harder for them uh, to do all of those maneuvers with. But, but, but there was a lot, I, I remember standing there watching them refuel the plane quite casually while we all just wandered around. I thought, there's something different about this scene from other refuelings I've seen. I thought, that's it. You don't usually see the flight crew standing on the grass next to the plane smoking while they're refueling it. <laughs> Uh, and there's this whole thing all the way through with the different approaches to risk, and the Americans are so upside about everything, and the Russians just so well, we do it like this all the time, it's kind of going to work. And the Russians have launched at least as many uh, vehicles into space, well, almost as many vehicles into space as the, the, the Americans, and have got away with it safely. Uh, uh, and, 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 um, uh, and I remember also that the, uh, the, the, you know, a friend of mine telling me about the way that they assembled the Soyuz capsules that. Um, you, you see them putting a shuttle together, and you've got a team of four engineers over a blueprint, and they're sort of saying, yeah, we're going to take Bolt Alpha 52 stroke 4 at hash Z, and we're going to take Screwdriver Beta 52 hash 4 stroke Z, and we're going to turn it four and a half rotations to the left through 900 degrees uh, with this much torque. And, and apparently when you watch them putting the Soyuz capsule together, they sit there with a bucket of bolts and the Soyuz, and they go, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the thing is that their flight safety director was, is comparable, if not better, than the Americans. So, so for me, that was the whole thing that framed all of this. But, uh, but, but, uh, and I think that I was able to appreciate the whole experience a lot better for it being uh, massively better. I mean, my, memory, my memories of that are much, much stronger and much richer of the whole trip to Moscow that, that, that bracketed this this whole event, and much richer than flying either in, out of Houston or, or, or out of Toulouse, to be honest with you. Uh, and for me, it was quite an eye-opening experience. I mean, I mean uh, you sort of the, the creativity that I think the team brought to it really enriched the whole thing for all of us. Um, I, I think it's very interesting in terms of the uh, clash of cultures is probably the wrong word, but the big sort of juxtaposition of those two cultures. Because I've seen it again recently, actually, between the artists and the scientists, uh, uh, when I, I did some work with some free divers. And that's a really interesting thing to watch up close. And if any of you have ever had, uh, you know, I'd love to see what you think. Because basically, free diving is, is mostly prosecuted by a bunch of uh, pretty much sort of like new age hippie types who are quite holistic in their approach to the world, themselves, and, and everything else, uh, and have a very, they don't have a particularly objective or scientific view of what they do, but they do it very beautifully and to a very high standard. Uh, and, 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 and that was true of, of the people who flew from the outside on this. Um, and on the other side, you've got a bunch of scientists who sit there watching this thing as though they're teenagers sneaking into their first horror movie and they've got this sort of sense of fascination and revulsion with the whole thing because freedom is quite dangerous but also physiologically quite fascinating and I, I, I think that was a lot of what this was like really that, that I think the physiology of 
microgravity is fascinating. Objectively, f flying with a team whose safety record you don't know after you've bumped them a bit of cash probably isn't the right way to do anything. But, but nevertheless, it sort of feels like you should go along with it because everybody else seems about quite happy with it. But there was footage from that Radio 4 presenter getting CPR done on them, wasn't there? Because yeah. <laughs> uh, what happens with that is, is that that it turns out is that when you have a deep vomit, you have this massive vagal response. So, so there's a, a I guess, a, a, one of the outflows in the brain puts the brakes on the heart very strongly. And when you vomit, that brake is put on really, really strongly. And so if you get to someone after they've had a massive faint too quickly and you feel their pulse, there is no pulse. Um, and, 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 and I'm pretty sure that's what happened on that flight because um, if, if you just, that's that thing in medicine, you never want to run because you never want to get there before it's had a chance to sort itself out. But, and, and so I think that's what happened on that flight because the flight paramedic thought, oh my god, she's got no pulse and we should probably do some research. So it probably would have been alright if they just left her for a while. Um, uh, 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 yes, I, I did the same thing in a hospital once, I watched someone faint and they were just across the